Good morning everybody and welcome to Harvest Live 2022. My name is Jenny and I am so excited to welcome you all here with us today. Did you know we have got 160,000 children joining in with Harvest Live this week? That is such an amazing number and I'm so happy to see all of you here with us. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank you for all those shout outs that you've been sending. If you keep half an eye on the bottom of the screen, you'll see that we'll be sharing those as we go through the lesson. And as we all take part in what I think is going to be the biggest harvest festival ever. Thank you as well for all of the questions that you've been uh, that you've been sending in. We've had loads of amazing questions already. So do keep them coming in because I have absolutely no doubt that when you meet our exciting speakers, you're going to have a lot more things to ask. So if you look at your, uh, your screen now, you should see that there is all the ways that you can ask questions to our expert speakers on the screen now. So today we are going to be learning all about carrots, but we're not just learning about any carrots. We are learning about carbon crunching carrots. But what on earth does that mean? Well, we're going to be learning all about a fascinating investigation that is taking place right now into how to grow and farm carrots in the most environmentally friendly way possible. And when we say the most environmentally friendly way, we mean in a way that traps as much carbon in the soil as we possibly can. Because the thing with carbon is we want to keep it trapped in the soil because we don't want it to escape and turn into carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas that can cause climate change. And so what farmers and scientists are doing at the moment is they're looking at how they can farm in a way that keeps as much of that carbon trapped in the soil as we possibly can. And so the way that we're doing that and what we're going to be learning about today is through a fair test. And when we conduct a fair test, it means that we have to keep everything completely the same. We keep everything nice and controlled and then we just change one variable or one thing. And a variable is anything that can affect the results that we are going to be observing or measuring. So there's quite a lot of big science words there. And so to make that make that make a little bit more sense, we're going to head out now to my friend Josh, who is out in the field um, and he's going to be um, he's going to be learning more about this real life investigation into how we can grow carbon crunching carrots. And while you're out there with Josh, what I'd like you to do is have if you have a look at the screen now, there is an activity sheet that you might have in front of you and you might be able to start filling in some of those questions while we learn about the carbon crunching carrot investigation. So let's go to Josh now and see what's going on. Hi Jenny, hi everyone watching around the world today. Really great to have you with us. We're in Yorkshire and I'm here with Stephen from Hunter Pack. How are you hi, doing? Josh, I'm good, you? Very good, thank Excellent. you. I'm very excited to find all about an experiment that is happening right beneath our feet. And this experiment today is all to do with something that is right here, which I'm just gonna see if I can find one. There's one there, Josh, so it's probably. <laughs> Carrots. So if you didn't know already, that's what we're learning about today. I think we'd have given you a few clues before you started the lesson, but Stephen, this huge field behind us is an experiment. Can you tell me a little bit more about it? Yeah, sure. So in this field, we've got approximately 24 million carrots across all the entire field. Um, and we've got three different, well, we've got three different blocks. Yeah. And in this block we're studying now, this is our control block. Fantastic. And how are those blocks separated? Uh, there's quite an easy way to see. I can see right Yeah, so you. you might well see a different colour across the field. So we've got our wildflower strips here, which are differentiating our blocks out. So the block that we're still on here now is our control block. Fantastic. And what is a control block? Why do you need that in your experiment? So in, in any experiment, you want to have your control, which is where you keep everything standard. Yeah. And then you can see the variables between the other experimental blocks. That's what we've got here on this Brilliant. Control. So this is our control block. You're doing exactly what you normally do. Yep. What do you normally do to grow a carrot? So we would normally plough a field. Uh, so when this block has been ploughed, we would then bed form. So we're creating a bed to then put the, yeah. uh, to actually drill the carrot seed into. Yeah. So by drilling, what do you mean by that? Drilling, get a, a drill, a literal drill would come across and would drag the seed in and drop the seed yeah. at specific points across the bed. So if people at, home, at school were thinking about that, they'd be talking about planting the seed. Yes, yeah. yes. Sticking it Obviously. in, it comes in, yeah. picks them all in, and they're growing to these guys. Indeed. Fantastic. So yep. that's how you normally do it. They're all in these beds, looking good, obviously working. Great so carrot. Far. What's going on over on this side then that's different? Yeah, so on the, on the left-hand side over here, what we've got here, we've got our low input field. So we've had, um, we've had a cover crop across all the field. Mm. Uh, and on this part of the field, we've had 30, about 83 sheep that have yeah. been uh, grazing the cover crop off. Fantastic. So what's a cover crop then? Because I think 
we might not know what that word means. As okay, non-farmers amongst yeah, non you might, not, might be going, mm, so, what's he talking about? So a cover crop, we've, we've got things like uh, oil seed radish, uh, yeah. which would help uh, fix nitrogen into the soil, yeah. uh, help the organic matter within the soil as well. Fantastic. Uh, so it helps the, the crop grow, really. So actually by growing something different before the carrots grow, it has a positive effect on the carrots growing? Yeah, it has a positive effect on the soil structure, yeah. which is the, the media, if you like, that helps the carrot yeah. grow. So they're growing inside the soil. Yep. It's helping that soil out. You said about 83 sheep. What are those 83 sheep doing? So the, the 83 sheep have a, have a critical part to play. So by eating the cover crop that we've got on this part of the field, what they would have done then is they would have pooed and that poo would have increased the organic matter that we've Fantastic. got. Fantastic. So that's also helping. It's more food for these carrots that are growing. Really. Indeed, those, yeah. They're helping the carrots grow through sheep poo. Yes. Who'd have known, you know? They're gonna, not only do they do the great job of getting all those radishes out of the way for growing the carrots, they're also making the soil even more healthy from to growing. That's an amazing part of an experiment. Yeah. Great. So we talked about sheep, radishes going on over here. Still stood in our control, doing everything normally. What's happening on the far side over here? So on the far side, what we what we normally do, well, in our control, we normally apply pesticides yeah. and insecticides to help the crop be healthy throughout its yeah, growing so season. Stopping kind of little insects from coming along and eating yeah, them up before they're ready. Exactly, yeah. So on the far side, we're using, rather using pesticides and insecticides, we're using something called biologicals. Yeah. So biologicals haven't been manufacturally made, they're not artificial, but they are they are naturally made, should we say. Yeah. So that reduces our carbon input on that side of the okay. field. So when you make those normal pesticides and that requires quite a lot of energy to make them obviously we know that fossil fuels cause climate change losing lots of energy does that yeah this is a more natural version of that yes that you're trying to see if actually you can get the same or better result indeed yeah so hopefully from each one of these trial plots what we'll then see are the benefits and we'll be able to see which one operates the, the best from carbon to reduce yeah. the carbon down and we'll be able to see which one has the best yield fantastic so how do you measure those things then well by measuring the yield which is the weight of the carrots yeah. so we have so on each bed that we're studying here we'll get a weight per bed yeah. or a weight per bulker which is the machine that harvests yeah. them into which we'll see later on uh, and then we'll be able to uh, determine which block has the best yeah, yield that we need. Gives you the most carrots, or yes. maybe not the most carrots, but the heaviest weight of all the carrots combined Indeed, together. Yeah, yeah. And then how do, I mean, that's quite easy to do, really. We know how to weigh things. We probably do that at school all the time. How on earth do you do something like measuring carbon, though? Measuring carbon uh, is a bit more difficult, as you can appreciate. So what we use, we use different calculators. There's yeah. industry calculators out there that help. So for, for, say, this field, for instance, we'd put in each process. So that might be ploughing, seeding, bed, re bed forming, or harvesting. Yeah. And from that, it calculates how much carbon is being used to create this field. Fantastic. And have you got any other technology that can help you with that as well, kind of in a real time sense? Yeah, sure. So we're also looking at, in this field as well, of putting in uh, different monitors to monitor carbon dioxide yeah. emissions, which, which will actually sit in the field and we'll be able to see carbon being emitted from the crop and also carbon ex it's exuding from the crop as well. Fantastic. So I mean, to summarise, this is an amazing experiment. You're seeing three different things here, and this field's about 30 acres, so about that's 30. about 30 football pitches. Yep. What will you do with all that information with the kind of, I know the Hunter Pack has 3,000 acres that you normally work yep. on. How will you use this information to influence what you do in that much bigger scale? So our plan for this field is we, we will look at the different elements that we've implemented across all three blocks. And then we will take them um, from learnings into next year and the following two to five years yeah. to then develop our our growing of carrots to make them, make them more carbon neutral in the future. Fantastic. So actually, by the time we reach 2035, so that's in about 13 years time, fields of carrots like this will be carbon neutral, which is amazing. That means they'll be storing as much carbon as they're emitting when the ploughing process happens and that's going on. So that's a fantastic target to have. Yep. Thank you so much, Stephen. It's been really great for you to show us this experiment. I've actually heard that there's another scientist in the field that is an expert in the bits in between that we touched on before, these wildflowers. I'm going to go and see if I can find her and ask her a little bit more. I'll catch up with you soon. Wow, what a fantastic investigation. So now what we're going to do is we are going to recap some of that scientific vocabulary that we've just learned. So in a fair test, the independent variable is the variable or the thing that we're changing. So what I'd like you to do now in your classrooms, have a bit of a talk and tell me what is the independent variable that we've just learned about in the carrot investigation. We're going to put some options, some choices so that, um, for your answer up on the screen now. Tell me which one you think it is. Which is the thing that we're changing in this investigation?
Okay, so the independent variable in this investigation was the, so the treatment of the soil. So it was what's happening in each of those beds to treat the soil. So my next question for you is the, um, oh, let's have a look. Oh yes, most of you got that right. That's amazing, well done. So the next question is what is the dependent variable in this investigation? Um, and the dependent variable is the thing that we measure in a scientific investigation. So there are actually two in this, um, in this investigation. Which two do you think they are? So the dependent variable in this investigation, oh, I'm not sure what that was. The dependent variable in this investigation was um, that we were measuring the, the yield. So the yield is the weight of the carrots that are, that are um, grown and the amount of carbon dioxide that is released. So it was the yield and the carbon dioxide release that we were measuring to see which way of farming was the most environmentally friendly. Um, so the last question for you before we go back to Josh is what are the variables, that, the variables that we need to control? What are the things that we need to keep the same between all of the different conditions, all the different ways of farming? So for example, one might be how much water we're giving each of those different um, carrot beds. So have a think and pop, pop your answers in the word cloud. What other things do we need to keep the same? Oh my goodness, I can see loads of amazing answers coming in. That's really, really good to see. Well done, everybody. I can see the amount of light, the amount, the same seeds, the, um, I can see the type of carrot. That's absolutely amazing. I think we've got so many scientists in that, um, watching this today. This is great. So many different variables that we could control. Really well done. That's loads of good answers there. So, okay, so we've had a chance to answer that question. So now Josh should have been able to track down a second scientist who is out in the field. So we're going to go back to that field camera and find out what this second scientist has been up to. Let's go and see. Hi everyone, I'm back again and you can see that I've found a carrot scientist. This is Hannah and she's a specialist in these bits that are in between the carrot fields that we talked about in the experiment. Hannah, can you tell me a little bit more about what's happening here? So what we've got here are some wild flowers and the idea behind having flowers in the middle of a carrot field is that the flowers provide food and shelter to some friendly insects like ladybirds or beetles and then these insects, these bugs, these kind of friendly bugs will then go out into carrot farmer Ben or carrot farmer Steve's carrot crop and they will eat the bad bugs which are transferring diseases or damaging the carrots so we don't want to eat them. 
Fantastic. So is that what you do as a job then? You're a scientist in this area looking at these wildflowers. What do you do day to day? What's it like being a carrot scientist? So I love being a carrot scientist. In particular, in the summer, you get to come out to fields like this and travel all over. And I spend a lot of time outdoors, walking around, being nice and active and getting to spend time looking at all of the bees and the bugs that are visiting these flowers. So it's really fun for me. In the winter time, it's thinking more about writing up yeah. what we've been studying and making sure that the graphs that we draw are very good and making sure that the data and yeah. the numbers we've collected are um, understood and analysed so we know what's going on and communicate it back to the farmers so they know what's the best thing to do in their carrot So fields. just like they've been doing an experiment with all the carrots, yes. you're doing some experiments that lets you know about actually what's working here. How do you measure these insects that are going on here? What, how do you get that data that you yeah. write up when you get to the winter? So there's two ways that we can do that. My favourite way is that we come out and we look at a patch of flowers and in that patch of flowers we stand here for 10 minutes and we capture any insect that visits. So if it's a bumblebee, if it's a fly, if it's a butterfly, if it's a ladybird, if it lands on the flower, we try and identify what species it is, so what type of insect, and then we count how many of them are and we tally that up. That's really cool. The other way that we can count these insects is by what we call trapping them. So we would set out some traps which would allow the insects to come in and then yeah. we can take them back to the laboratory because obviously when they're flying around like this, it can be quite hard to tell what they are. Yeah. If we can take them back to a laboratory, it means that we can really go into the detail of looking at their wings and how many hairs they've got and the different oh, coloured amazing. bands that help <laughs> you identify the different species. But the downside of that yeah. is that unfortunately we have to kill some of the insects yeah, so to do not that. Not so good for the insects maybe. No. So we're trying to find new ways yeah. of understanding what insects are in our fields. Well you say new ways, there's a quite a fancy thing that's going on it's over so here. Cool. Uh, what's this here? This is another way of measuring what, what's going on over here down here. So we have here a box. It looks very kind of... I don't know, simple. You probably wouldn't notice it if you walked past it in a field. But what this box is doing is recording the sounds of different insects as they fly along. So you can see, or you might be able to see right now that we've got a honeybee just visiting here. We've got quite a lot of honeybees. And this box is picking up the wings of these insects as they're flying along the strip. And the really good thing about this is, obviously, they aren't harmed, the insects. But we can tell because these insects are different, a bit like all of us, and we have different types of voices. These insects have different kinds of sounds. And the other kind of quite cool thing I find about this box is we've kind of got some solar panels. So you can leave this box out and it will record all day and all night. And the great thing about that from my perspective as a scientist is yeah. I don't have to be here and we can yeah. still collect some fantastic data. Lots and lots of data and that individual yeah. wing flapping sound. That's yes. amazing that you can use technology to tell you about the type of insect just by the speed that it beats its wings. One thing you should probably try at home, actually, I find if you're in the garden, there's lots of wasps about yep. at the moment. Wasps, to me, sound very different to flies. So it's something, you know, if you're in the garden or if you're in the park or something and you're hearing insects flying about, have a listen out to see if you can try and hear the differences so between how they're own bit of You could do your own bit of entomology at home there, listening out for different wing beat speeds. That's amazing. Talking of entomologists, there's one type of insect as well that we're going to cover that's also happening here that we can't look at with Hannah because they're absolutely tiny. So I'm going to pass you back over to the studio with Sally Ann and Jenny, who are going to be looking at another type of insect that's really interesting and useful for carrot farmers. Isn't that amazing? I cannot believe that those scientists can count and identify the types of pollinators in their fields just by listening to their wings, their wings beating. What an amazing, amazing um, piece of science there. So, as Josh just said, I'm very, very, very excited to introduce our next speaker, our next guest. This is Sally Ann. She is an absolutely amazing insect specialist, but what's the what's the scientific word for that? So I'm an entomologist. An entomologist. So Sally Ann, can you tell us more about these helpful invertebrates that we were just talking about out in the field? Yeah, so what you saw there was a wildflower strip mm -hmm. and you get beneficial insects in there. So you get your pollinators and they're part of our beneficial insects. They, okay. they do something that's really good for us. Right, really. okay. So you've got something like your, if you're growing your carrots for seed, you need to have the flowers pollinated. Okay. So your pollinators go back and forwards. And you also get things that live on the nectar, but they might lay their eggs in something that's eating 
the vegetables that the farmer's growing. Oh my goodness, so they lay their eggs in, in, a, in a pest? Yes, yeah, so you get parasitic wasps, little tiny wasps. So there's okay. lots of different types of wasps, not just the wasps you see in the nest inside your house or yeah. something like yeah. that. Lots and lots of different types of ones. And there's a little tiny parasitic wasps and they will fly out looking for a caterpillar, okay. say in the, in the crop, and then they will lay their egg inside it. Inside it. Inside it. And the larvae, the baby wasp, will yeah. keep growing, eating the caterpillar from the inside. Oh, my goodness. And then it's nice and safe inside the caterpillar, you see. Nothing else can get to it. So it protects the babies. Absolutely. Right. And then the caterpillar will die. Oh, but the, the caterpillar is the, the pest the that would pest have been eating the, farmer, the carrot. Eating the okay, crop. I see. And then the, the wasp will then actually come out of the body as fully formed wasps, little parasitic wasps, wow. and fly off to get more caterpillars. Oh my goodness, that's fascinating. So it's a so biological that's... control. It's wow. really, really important and beneficial for the farmer. Wow, that is, that's really, really helpful to eat away all those pests. And then, so what are the, what are the effects of that? What are the implications for the farmer? If you've got insects that are helping you by eating up all the insects that would eat the carrots, what are the, what's, the, what's the impact of that for farming? Well, it's really important for the farmer because he doesn't have to use the chemicals. He doesn't ah, have to okay. use insecticides. So he, can, so he doesn't need to use as many chemicals no. because the insects are helping him. Absolutely. So there's no, no, no wider damage done to the environment, if you like, because the insects are actually part of the healthy ecosystem and they are maintaining the crops out there. They're helping with the soils as well and various things that the farmer needs to be able to grow his crops. So how are they helping with the soil? Ah, well, there's something else that's out there. Okay. Something, and there's billions and millions, well, just millions of these other invertebrates. They're not insects, they're another type of invertebrate. Okay, tell us more. And that, well, in this soil sample here, yeah. from the field where the carrots were growing, mm -hmm. there could be thousands of them. Thousands in this sample here? And what I'm talking and about what are, they? are nematodes. Nematodes, like, like toads? So little, like worms. Oh. But don't think about the worms that are segmented. So if you think of an earthworm, yes. it has all those segments on its body. Like the rings? Like the rings all yep. the way around. So mm -hmm. they're not like that. They're just nice, smooth bodies. Okay. So they are worms, but not as the same family as earthworms. Okay. And are they the same sort of size as an earthworm? Well, that they we vary. Can... They vary right. a lot. So in something like this, I'd want to put it under a microscope okay. to find them. They're microscopic. They're really, really tiny. Okay. But if, if you went through your compost bin and you started looking through rotting leaves and things like that, you might see them with the naked eye. So you oh, can actually wow. see the little tiny white ones. So they are quite big as well. You quite can big. get big ones. Yeah. And you can get a massive one. <gasps> a huge one, eight to nine meters long. So we're talking really big. No way. And that can actually live inside a whale. Oh my goodness! But not you wouldn't get a, a really big one in a carrot field, no. would you? No. no. So um, we have got actually some of your microscope footage, haven't we? Yes, we have. So, so yes. we can actually it's see these work. nematodes at work. So if you look, everybody on the screen, this is what Sally Ann's talking about. These are the teeny tiny insects that live in the soil and help the farmers. So Sally Ann, can you explain how do they how do they help the farmers and what are they doing here? So there's lots and lots of different nematodes that live in different environments. So these ones are in the soil. And uh, what they're doing is they're going around, and depending on their species, so it depends on the type of nematode they are, they could be eating fungi in the soil, bacteria, so they're helping with all the soil health as well. Okay. And they might be eating other nematodes that might be harming plants, okay. so the farmer's crop or something like that. Uh, and they can be used as a biological control. Right. So with something like the carrots, you might have slugs munching on them. Okay. And the farmer doesn't want slugs eating the carrots because he can't then sell the carrots because they've got holes all over yes. them. And you can actually buy nematodes, special nematodes that like to predate slugs. So they like to predate means they like to they like to eat yep, the slugs. Yeah, they hunt the slugs out. They hunt find them. them. Gosh. So you, you buy them, you add them in with a bit of water. Okay. And you spray them out onto the crop. Yeah. And then they go into the soil, and then they will hunt slugs. Oh my goodness! So these are such clever creatures that we're looking at here, aren't we? So they're yeah. they're eating the pests. They're eating the slugs that would have eaten the the farmer's carrots. And then they're also helping with the, the health of the soil. Absolutely. And wow. so they're really, really important. And by putting the nematodes on the soil yeah. to control the slugs, the farmer's not using other chemicals okay. that could so have it's... an impact on the wider environment and, and all the other in, in wildlife, so the biodiversity on the farm. Right. And so this is a, this is a natural way of yeah. controlling the Do you the, want to know how they control the slugs? Pests. Oh, my goodness, yes. I think <laughs> we, we probably do want to know, don't we, everybody? I, I think, think so. we do. So what they do is they'll, they'll find the slug okay. and they'll all come towards it. Oh, so lots of little tiny lots ones will come. Lots of tiny, tiny okay. nematodes on the yeah. slug. And they'll find anywhere they can to get into the slug's body. Okay. So sometimes, if you look at a big slug, sometimes you find slugs this time of the year 
um, out on the paths late at night, the big black slugs. And if yeah. you look very carefully, they have a hole that they breathe through. Yeah. And the nematodes can all cluster in through the hole into oh, the, what we call the respiratory system. Okay. And then they, they have a bacteria in their own gut. So the nematodes carry a bacteria okay. that they release inside the slug. Mm. And the bacteria kills the slug. And the nematodes are all feeding on that inside the slug's body. And then they reproduce. So they produce lots more nematodes. And then they all burst out the slug's body and go off to find more. Oh, my goodness. Wow, that is very, uh, very clever. Yes. Not, I mean, it's great news for the farmer. Great news for the nematode. Not mm. so good news for the slug. Not literally. so good for the slug, no. Can we just have a quick look at your microscope footage again? Because I just wanted to get, to get you to... Um, to show it, to talk us through what we're looking at. So you can see the nematodes wiggling away. And then can we actually, on this footage, can we see them? Is there, is there any, what's, what, can you, what can you tell us? What are we looking at? So you're looking there at the, so these nematodes are going through the soil um, looking for various different things. So different nematodes do different things. We, uh, we actually have a pest, what we call a problem nematode for a lot of farmers as well. Mm. So they can affect the crops in a bad oh, way. Oh, so they're not always, way. so different types of nematodes, are, they're not always good news. No, not always. So some okay. nematodes will have um, a mouth part which allows them to attach to the root of the plant. Right. And then they'll feed through the plant tissue on the root of the plant. Okay. Other nematodes can actually bury themselves into the root of the plant so with carrots feed. obviously we eat the root of the plant don't we so yes. we don't we don't want to be having any holes in that um so can you see them you can see them eating can't you yes this, you can see this. all the gut bacteria oh my goodness them. wow so They're inside so small, there you can see through them so that microscope must be so strong that we can see inside yeah. a nematode which is already microscopic and it's moving wow. around. What they're using, in the soil, you get water in the soil, very, yeah. very thin films of water, and that's what they're moving around. That's why they look as though they're almost sort of in a liquid, because they really are. They're in the water in the soil. The water within the soil. Wow, that's and absolutely amazing. And they're so tiny that to move yeah. around the farm, they're mo these are soil nematodes, they're moving in the soil. Mm. So if you think of something like the farmer going through with a plough, or whether they're driving a tractor around and they're picking up soil on the on the tractor wheels, yeah, they can actually be moving thousands of nematodes around the field. Oh my goodness! On the machinery. Wow. So next time I see a patch of soil just like this one that we've got yeah. here, it could have thousands and thousands of these little creatures. Yeah. They are in it. everywhere. Wow. For every human on the planet, there are probably at least, and we might be underestimating this. 57 billion nematodes. For every human? For every oh human. my goodness, wow, there are so many of them. There's a lot of them. And, they, uh, and lots of them do important good jobs and then some of them are not so good. Yes. Is that right? Okay. And just quickly tell me, so we, we've talked about nematodes helping the, the health of the soil. Why is the health of the soil so important? Why do farmers want to protect their soil? Well, if you don't protect your soil, you can't grow your crops. Ah, uh, so it affects the crop as well. Yes, okay. absolutely. So the, the quality of the soil is what's, what's helping the roots grow down mm -hmm. and have that nutrient uptake. Yeah, so and it makes a really nice, nutritious, if we're in this, in this um, context, carrots. Carrots, so yes. So the roots are going to be full of nutrients. Yeah, and the, the soil is a, is a live environment. There's lots and lots of things going on in here. Mm -hmm. Not just nematodes, there's soil mites and, and all sorts of different things. Lots of oxygen, lots of water, and lots of things going on that, that keeps the soil healthy. Gosh. And a healthy soil is, is a a living soil, lots and lots of things in there. Get it under a microscope, have a look. Yes, absolutely, I can't wait. The next time I see a patch of soil, I am gonna have a closer look. Um, so thank you so much for that, sally -Ann. sally -Ann will be staying with us to do the question and answer section. So I'm sure she has talked about a lot of things already, but I'm sure you've got some more questions. So if you would like to ha ask your questions, do use that contact information that I shared at the beginning to send them in. So now we've learnt all about the science behind growing the carrots. We've learnt all about the insects and the invertebrates that help us grow those carrots. But now we need to know what happens after the carrots have been grown. What's the next step? So I do believe I have just been told that Josh has made it to a different field. So he's going to show us what happens, how we're going to get, what's the next stage of the carrots journey to get them towards our dinner plates. So let's go to Josh in a carrot field. Thanks, Jenny. So I'm in the field now with Adam, who's the farm foreman for Hunter Pack here in Yorkshire. And Adam, what on earth is going on behind us? Well, we've got the process of lifting carrots going on behind us. We've got the first machine on the front of the tractor um, is removing the tops and all foliage. The tractor then is powering a, a harvester behind him, which is lifting the carrots and separating the carrots from the soil and then loading them into the trailer, which has been driven alongside, uh, ready to be taken to the cleaner loader. Fantastic. So I can see it's just going past us and then the trailer's got a final destination. So we're going to go and have a quick look where the trailer goes 
after it's got full of these lovely orange carrots. Let's go and have a look. Okay, so we've just come round the corner. We've come to the next stage of the process. So to my right, there's a huge trailer full of carrots. Uh, what's going on here now, Adam? Yeah, we've got the trailer that's been filled by the harvester and that's been brought over to our field cleaner. He's going to tip his carrots into this hopper and the machine is going to extract excess soil and stone and top from the carrots to produce a clean carrot that is then loaded into the wagon to go to our pack house in Preston. So why do they need to be a little bit cleaner before they go into the wagon? Um, cost of it, um, transportation. We don't want to take soil and stone away from the field um, and, and to transport it around the country and to leave it behind in the field um, and to make, make it easier for the pack house. Fantastic. So what we're going to do now is, as you can see, all of these carrots that have come out of the field that have been lifted today are going into this big trailer here, this wagon that says Hunter Pack on the side. That's going to be pulled now by a tractor to the yard and then by a lorry over to Preston where Hunter Pack are based and where Jenny is right now. So let's go back to Jenny and find out what happens to these carrots once they arrive at the pack house. Over to you, Jenny. Okay, amazing. So now we've learnt how the carrots are harvested. I've now got Matty here with me. sally Ann is uh, just over Hello, there. Everyone. She'll be back in a second. And we've got Matty. Thanks so much for joining us. And you're going to talk us through what happens. when we, We're now we're currently at a carrot processing factory. And so we've got a little bit of footage from inside the factory to show, haven't we? Yes. And you're going to talk us through just sort of what we can see on the screen and what happens to the carrots when they Absolutely. arrive here at the, at the factory. So amazing. So let's have a look at that, that footage. And Matty can tell us what's going on. The carrots arrive at Hunter Park after they've been harvested. Um, now they are being transferred with a powerful water jet on an uplift conveyor belt. This is where the carrots have been uh, separated from stones and soil and other debris coming from uh, the harvesting fields. As you can see here, this is all recycled water. 550,000 litres of water are being pumped into this recycled tank. Uh, the carrots will continue their journey uh, all the way on, onto the uh, brushes, which we call the hatch hop, which is a series of brushes removing the dirt. They are now being inspected prior to the polishing stage, where they are getting a nice and smooth uh, finish. All the carrots are travelling to the hydro cooler, where they are going to get sprayed with chilled water making sure the temperature drops below 8 degrees and they achieve a longer shelf life. This is our grading system where large, medium and small carrots are being sorted before uh, getting packed. All carrots are visually inspected making sure that the good ones are getting packed and the other ones um, are going to get used somewhere else where you're going to find out later. This is the camera grader system where all the defects have been uh, identified and the carrots have been removed. Um, now they're ready to be uh, placed in the bags, sealed, packed into trays, stored in chillers and dispatched to supermarkets. Perfect. So there's one more process that I need to understand, isn't there? So I'm going to just run next door now to meet your colleague Louise yes. and I'm going to learn about the last stage. What happens to those carrots that don't make, make it into the bags that go to the supermarkets? So I, because I'm going into a food um, environment, I've got to put some, uh, I've got to get changed. I've got to put some PPE on. Um, and so you're, I'm going to pop up in a second. But while I'm gone, what I'd like you to do is have a look again at that activity sheet and see if you can answer any of the any more questions um, and also wh while I'm just quickly getting changed if you want to send in more of your um, shout outs or any more of your questions then please do get them sent in I'm going to run next door and meet Louise now and I'll be back shortly
So here we are, we've popped next door to the other factory to find out what's going to happen to those carrots that don't make it into the bags for the supermarket. So Louise, can you tell us what is going to happen? What do you do here with all these carrots? Yeah, sure. So these carrots, we want to make sure uh, that we use as much of the crop as possible. So um, we do this by using the carrots that don't meet the customer requirements for the retailers. So any that have any fanging or any misshapes, or, or just a bit smaller carrots. So we use these to make uh, carrot powder. Carrot powder? And so what do you use carrot powder for? What is it for? So currently we use uh, carrot powder as in pet food and as a, a natural feed additive for chickens, for example. Uh, but hopefully uh, through additional accreditations we can use that uh, in human food as well. Oh, amazing. So absolutely nothing out of the carrots that you're growing uh, is going to go to waste. Yeah, we want to reduce the waste as much as possible um, so we get a more efficient uh, product. That's amazing. So should we go and find out how it, how it all works? Yeah. Right, let's go and have a look. So what's going on here? So the carrots are tipped from the crate um, onto the production line. So they pass over rollers here to be graded for anyone just picked out uh, that we don't want to go for processing. So that's the fourth grading that these carrots go through. Yeah. Okay, and then what goes on, what happens next? They go up to the conveyor, yeah. and then they'll uh, go on to the dicer. Oh, let's go and have a look at that. that okay, so what's happening here? So the carrots get diced here. Okay, so we've got the puree, which is like mushed up carrot, so it's turned it into like a paste, hasn't yep. it? Um, and so what happens after that? So we want to dry the carrots now. So carrots are 90% moisture. 90%? Yeah. Wow. So for example, out of 500 uh, kilograms of carrots, we'll get 50 grams of powder. Like that is how much water is in there. Wow. So we place uh, the purees on some hot rollers and the, the purees spread along the rollers really thin. Uh, in order to dry out. So it'll, on this process, it goes from puree to powder. And that's done by the hot rollers, is yeah. it? Yeah, wow. at really high look. temperature. Oh wow, it's completely dry. So how long does it take? How long does it take for these rollers to turn it into powder? So it's 10 minutes overall. Wow, that's so quick. So the puree pass along these hot rollers and then a knife scrapes um, the flake off to uh, form a sheet of essentially tracing paper like this. So it comes out really thin. Oh wow, so it's almost like... Um, and it's dried. Like a flake, like fish food kind yeah. of texture. Wow. So we've got a few more steps now. So we want to make this into uh, fine granules of powder. Brilliant. So where are we going next? Uh, we'll just go over there. Okay, let's go. So what's going on here? So after the carrot flake is produced, it gets vacuumed and placed in a, a miller. So that's to get it right down to a fine, fine grain. So from the flake to a right fine powder. Oh, okay, so is that a similar process to how we make flour out of, from wheat? Yes, yeah, similar. So you want to get it uh, as really small as possible. So obviously yeah. going from the flake uh, to a powder so we can bag it. Oh, brilliant. So where's, where's the next? Yep, so stage? bagging station is just here. So we'll have a look at the finished product. So from carrots, it goes to powder. Wow, that's a really fine powder, isn't it? So it's completely ready now to, to be sent off and turned into products. Yeah. Amazing. And all of that from something that would have just been, been wasted. That's such a good idea. I think that's amazing. So Louise and I are going to take off all our PPE and we're going to get back into uh, the studio where she'll be ready to answer some of your questions. So you've got a couple of minutes now where we run and get our hair nets off and we'll be ready to answer your questions in a couple of minutes. So keep those questions coming in.
Okay, so we're back here. So I've got my panel here. We've got Matty and we've got Sally Ann uh, back to answer the questions. Oh gosh, look what that hairnet's done to me. Um, okay, so I am going to ask some questions. Some, thank you so much for sending them in. We've got loads. We're going to do as many as we can. So, um, Matty, first of all for you, do carrots actually help you see in the dark? Yes, indeed they do. They contain uh, a better carotene, which uh, one, it converts into the human body into vitamin A, which not only helps your sight, but also does help your heart, kidneys and lungs as well. So indeed they do, yeah. Wow, so lots of benefits to um, eating carrots. That's good to know. Um, okay, so let's have a look. What's the second most popular question? Um, oh, it's another carrot one. Um, so how are the seeds produced to make more carrots? That's a good one. Yes, well, um, when the carrots are not being harvested and they're being left in the, in, in the soil and then obviously they flower and they produce a very nice beautiful flower, white and lacy, which then uh, it, it, it transforms into seeds. But botanically talking, they're not actually seeds, they're more like dried fruits. Okay. And, and this is how then those fruits are being small, tiny fruits that look like seeds, they're being collected and then harvested again and then they grow more and more carrots. Oh, wow, okay. Um... So, Sally Ann, this is one for you. Uh, what type of soil do the nematodes live in? So, they live in lots of different types of soils all around the planet, actually. So, you will find them anywhere, to be honest with you, where there's soil invertebrate um, nematodes in soil. They like the sort of loamy soils, though, but having said that, <laughs> having said that, um, they do like a little bit of water in the soil. That's quite important. And when you're adding nematodes to soil, if you're doing the beneficial nematodes, then um, you can add them with water and the water goes in the soil and that helps them move around. So, oh, okay. so they will live in dry soils, but they don't want yeah. to be really, really dry. No, they, not, they like a bit of water because that's we learned, didn't we? That's how they, that's how they transport themselves. Um, okay, so are there different nutritional values for the different coloured carrots? Because then you can get different colours, can't you? Yes, you can. Yeah, I mean, uh, this goes back to maybe, let's say, 1100 uh, years old when the carrots were initially purple and yellow. Um, Yes, the, the nutritional values are very, very similar. Okay. So, so irrespective of the colour, but uh, the two varieties are not being um, currently grown very often. So yeah. everyone sticks to the orange one mm. as of the beta carotene level, which is very, very healthy. Yeah. So, and that's. Can you explain a little bit about why is the why are the carrots orange? Yeah, because of this this beta carotene that it, it is orange. So that's that's the pigment that actually determines the the colour orange for for um, for the carrots. That, that's the main reason, yes. Sorry, I've got so many questions here, so I'm just scrolling. I'm trying to find some, some nematode ones as well. Um, if you want to upvote the questions, if you, if you, if you like the look of a question um, and you'd like us to answer it, then do vote for it. Do you click the little, uh, the little like button and, we'll try, and uh, we'll try and get that answered for you. Um, do you know what the average yield is for, uh, for carrots? It, I guess it would depend on the size, the size of the, uh, the it field, does, wouldn't it? It does depend on the size of the field and it does depend on the variety of the carrots. You'll probably uh, notice if you already know there are bigger carrots and smaller carrots and that will determine the yield. And, and of course, what also determines the yield is the weather conditions. So carrots do need about three, four hours of sunlight per day. Oh, do they? Yes, yes, to, um, to, to grow and um, yeah, so that will determine the yield. Um, oh, we've got a good one. Um, a question, somebody's asking, maybe Sally, maybe you could talk about this. What is, um, what's a cover crop? So what's a cover crop? So a cover crop is um, something that you would plant over the ground when it's bare. Otherwise, it would be bare soil. So you don't want it eroding away. Uh, so you plant, um, plant radishes or something um, that is like a mustard or different crop crops that will actually add nitrogen to the soil. Yeah and the roots will help with the soil structure, so really important for soil health. Okay. And then you would make sure that the ground is covered through the winter, perhaps. So that means that the wind, the rain can't wash away the topsoil, that really, really important topsoil. And then you will remove your cover crop or you will plant your new crop inside into the cover crop. So it's just protecting the soil, protecting maintaining the soil. the soil and increasing the soil health. Mm. We're learning a lot about that, aren't we? Soil, is, soil health is really, really important. Um, for farmers and for everyone, isn't it? Um, so I've just seen another one, but they keep moving around. Um, oh, it's just gone. Uh, how long does it take to grow carrots, Matty? Can you tell us that one? Yeah, well, again, this is, this is based on, on the variety of carrots. So you're going to have different varieties based, based on, on where they are being, being uh, harvested and, you know, and planted. So, yeah, it will, it will depend very much on that. 
So yeah, you'll be looking for like end of season for, for carrots is, is June. Okay. So then yeah, we just start with, with fresh new, new carrots after that. Okay. Um, and Salient, why are bugs important? It's quite a big question. Why are bugs important? That's a huge question. Yeah, a huge That's a massive question. question. Why are best? bugs important? If anyone can answer this question, Salient. Oh, wow. Well. So we were talking about beneficial insects before. So we're talking about pollinators. We're talking about insects that are predatory. You know, they're actually attacking other insects that are probably being pests to us and things like that. They help with everything. They're really important for our water quality because we have invertebrates and bugs and things in the water. Yeah. They're helpful in our soil. Our soil, as we said earlier, is a living place. There's lots and lots of different types of bugs in that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they are part of that ecosystem, that, that healthy system that involves us being able to grow our food. Everywhere we go, there are bugs and they're all doing things that create that environment for us to be able to grow food as wonderful as theirs. So it's about working with them, isn't it? It's, it's about, about working with the them. Insects. You know, they, they just are. And do you know what? I can go a little bit further if you like. Chocolate. So okay. you can dip carrots in chocolate. But if you're thinking about farming, farming is in anything that's uh, grown outside will have had an interaction with bugs in one way or another. Yeah. And so many of our crops are pollinated. Mm -hmm. by flies yeah and uh f there's a fly that pollinates the carrot uh the cocoa bean oh wow so we need if we want chocolate we've got to have yeah. flies as well and if you're growing carrots you have flowers when we talk mm. about the flowers for carrot yeah. seeds you need pollinators so they're really important for all our crops and really food. important for all of our food really absolutely um, I've got a good one here. So how do the nematodes eat the slugs because they're so small? That's a really good question. It doesn't say who it's from, but it's a really good question. So, so how do they do that? So we'll go back to what they were doing. So when they find the slug in the soil, they want to get inside the slug. That's what they're doing. So they're going to look for any entrance that they can get into. So it might also be into the mouth or something like that. And they'll get into the slug. And then once inside the slug, so they'll wiggle around inside the slug, they then release a bacteria. So the nematodes have a bacteria inside them and they release that inside the slug and then that kills the slug and they feed on that inside the slug. Gosh, wow. What a way to go. <laughs> um, and so what are the black dots inside the nematodes? That's another one, a good, another good observation. So some of that will be things that are inside the stomach if it's a nematode that's actually eating things inside the soil or it could be actually the bacteria that you can see that the nematode would release inside something else. And another person's asking why nematodes plant their eggs inside insects. So it depends on what type of nematode it is. So not all nematodes are eating other insects, if you like, or feeding within other insects, parasitizing them. Some nematodes are just free living inside the soil. Um, but the ones that, that do that are, yes, they, they are parasitizing and they could kill their host. Not always. Not all nematodes kill their host. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so Matty, one for you. Um, we've been asked here, where do the carrots go when they're washed? So we saw in, we've seen earlier where they, they go into the bags. So where are they going after that? After they, they go into the bags, obviously they, they are going into trays and the trays in, in the cold stores and they get chilled and then mm -hmm. dispatched to the supermarkets. And that, that is the process that, that happens, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, that's, so next time you see carrots on the shelves in the supermarkets, you're going to know all of these really interesting processes that have happened to get those carrots into the supermarket. Um, so let's do, we're running a little bit behind schedule, so I think we'll do, we'll do one more. Let me just see what's been upvoted. So I've got so many questions, I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Um, Okay, so we've done all the top ones. Matty, do you know, why are, why are the, the inside of carrots sweeter than the skin? That's yes, a good question. Yes, that, that happens because of the level of sugar. So the level of sugar inside the carrots so it will trans, translate from the outside, from the skin, into the middle of the carrots. So that's determining the, the actual sweetness of the carrots. And well, you'll probably notice that the carrots are, are sweeter on the tip and inside okay. as well. Yeah, and they'll be bitter at the, at the end. I, I did not know that. I had no idea about that. Um, Okay, so one more for you, Sally Ann. Um, let's see. What plants do bugs like? Oh, golly, what plants do bugs like? It depends on their life stage as well. So, some insects like to lay their eggs and eat the leaves and perhaps the stems or the roots. Um, and others will come into the seeds, even when the plants produce seeds, they might come in and then eat the seeds of the plants. And then there might be others that come into the flowers for the nectar and for the pollen. So, um, oh golly, just loads, loads of interaction with plants, absolutely loads, whether it's a positive interaction, yeah. 
like pollination, mm -hmm. or it's a negative interaction, like they are consuming the plant and damaging it and preventing it from growing. And eating our carrots. And eating yeah. our carrots, okay. yes. We don't want that. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you both. Thank you so much for answering all our questions. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It's been amazing. It's gone so quickly. Um, I hope we've answered um, lots of your questions for you and that you've had a great time. Um, we will be back tomorrow with another Harvest Live lesson all about wheat. And um, we're calling that the world's largest car combine harvester. So do join in with that tomorrow if you are interested. But for now, it's bye from me and bye from everyone else here at Henterpack.